Hello friends, this is a re-recording of Friday's lecture because when I went to upload the video I discovered that the audio had not been recorded and I've changed my notes enough this year that I didn't really have an equivalent lecture from a previous semester. So <clears throat> we had been talking about how to identify a number of different kinds of protons that are present in a molecule. And remember that protons are equivalent when uh, uh, for example, as in a methyl group, you can exchange their environments completely by rotating around a carbon-carbon bond, or they're equivalent when they're interchangeable via some symmetry operation. For example, protons that are interchangeable by a C2 axis of symmetry, as an example, are homotopic, identical always, whereas protons that are interchangeable through a mirror plane are enantiotopic, usually identical except in a chiral environment. So these methyl protons are homotopic. These CH2 protons are enantiotopic to each other. These terms, homotopic, diastereotopic, and enantiotopic, refer to the relationship between protons or groups of protons. So it's a relational term. We looked at this larger molecule and we, for example, identified that the methyl protons here, H, G, and F in blue, were homotopic and identical to each other. That the pink methyl protons here are identical to each other and to these methyl protons here because of the C2 axis of symmetry through the middle of the molecule and the plane of the page, which would allow these two methyl groups to be interchangeable. We talked about how these two uh, CH2 protons, E and D, are enantiotopic to each other but are homotopic to the other CH2 group. So you would expect to see one NMR signal for the protons in orange. Similarly, the green protons are homotopic, interchangeable by this same C2 axis of symmetry, and the purple proton is its own thing. So overall, one, two, three, four, five different kinds of protons. We expect to see five NMR signals. Uh, we can practice this further. If you look at cyclopropane, you expect to see one and only one kind of proton and one NMR signal because by symmetry, each of these protons is interchangeable. The top protons are uh, mirror images of the ones on the bottom, or actually the top protons are interchangeable with the ones on the bottom through a C2 axis of symmetry in the plane of the page that goes through this atom. Uh, uh, protons on this carbon are interchangeable with those on this carbon via a C3 axis of symmetry. In any case, these protons are all homotopic, only one kind of proton, one kind of NMR signal. <coughs> How about here? Uh, vinyl protons, two vinyl protons on the same carbon can be different from each other. D and E are diastereotopic because if uh, I replaced one with Z, versus the other with a Z group, we would have two different diastereomers. So D and E are diastereotopic and are different. Of course, the methyl protons are identical to each other because of rotation around a carbon-carbon bond. We could call them homotopic. So we would expect to have three different kinds of protons for this molecule. How about uh, cyclopropane, where we replace one of the protons with a chloro group? What does that do? Well, once that chloro group is there, protons D and E are no longer identical to each other. D is cis to the chloro group, but, is tran but E is trans to the chloro group. So D and E, on the cyclopropane ring are diastereotopic. They are distinct and you would expect to see different NMR signals for D and E. So I'm going to use different colors for D and E. However, by mirror symmetry, B and D are equivalent to each other. We would say they are enantiotopic. Similarly, we could say that C and E 
are enantiotopic. And then uh, A is its own is its own thing. So we would expect to see three NMR signals for this uh, chlorocyclopropane. Finally, perhaps more complicated, if we look at this <coughs> last molecule, a cyclopropane ring with an OH group, and uh, and then two CH two, uh, three groups, we would see that of course the OH proton is distinct, and HB is unique. We would see that HC and HD are diastereotopic because one is cis to the OH group and the other is trans. You could use the same thought experiment here to illustrate that they are diastereotopic. Similarly, we would see that the methyl group E and the methyl group F are diastereotopic, those two methyl groups. The are diastereotopic, so therefore I expect to see one, two, three, four, five, six kinds of protons. Six NMR signals. Okay, so that skill of identifying which protons are dis different from each other versus identical is really important and it's something that you should work at. Now, with that in mind, we need to consider three key uh, pieces of information that are available from an NMR spectrum. The first tells us something about the environment of a proton based on its chemical shift. The second is that the integrated area of an NMR, a peak in an NMR spectrum, tells us something about how many protons are represented by that NMR signal. Finally, the shape of the peak will tell us something about the connectivity of the molecule or what other protons are adjacent to a proton represented by a given NMR signal. Let's begin with chemical shift or the position of a signal. The key point here is that the electronic environment of a proton changes its chemical shift in a predictable way. And the most useful concept for rationalizing how environment of a proton relates to its chemical shift is the concept of shielding versus deshielding. The idea here is that we've talked about nuclei, such as the hydrogen nucleus or the carbon nucleus, as being magnets. And they are responsive to the external magnetic field that we apply uh, to these molecules in the NMR spectrometer. Uh, a, a nucleus on its own, not surrounded by any electrons, would experience the full power of the external magnetic field. However, a nucleus surrounded by electrons will be shielded to some extent from the external magnetic field. And this has to do with physics. The presence of an external magnetic field causes the electrons around a nucleus to circulate in a way so you know that from physics, charged particles move in curved pathways in, the mag in a magnetic field. The electrons surrounding that nucleus circulate in such a way that they themselves generate what is called an induced magnetic field. Again, this is a concept from physics. Just as charged particles are responsive to magnetic fields and move in curved pathways in the presence of magnetic fields, so do charged particles, when moving in circular pathways, generate magnetic fields of their own. So here is an example of that. In black is the circular pathway moved by the electrons in this blue cloud. And then this little arrow represents the induced magnetic field, lowercase b because it's smaller than the external magnetic field, subscript i for induced, so this small lowercase b i uh, 
induced magnetic field is generated by the circular pathway of the electrons that happen in the presence of this external magnetic field. Therefore, the nucleus in the middle of this cloud of electrons does not feel the full power of the external magnetic field, but rather is shielded from it somewhat by the induced magnetic field created by the moving electrons. Such a nucleus is said to be shielded. Now, because the strength of the magnetic field experienced by a nucleus is related to the energy gap between the spin states aligned with versus against the external magnetic field. With a larger applied magnetic field B0 leading to a stronger, larger gap between spin states and therefore a larger frequency or chemical shift at which the proton absorbs. Then nuclei that are shielded will absorb at smaller frequency or smaller chemical shift than nuclei that are deshielded. Shielded nuclei experience a lower magnetic field and therefore absorb at a lower frequency or chemical shift. Deshielded nuclei experience a larger magnetic field and therefore absorb at a higher frequency or chemical shift. This is indicated by this sort of schematic here where this might be where a proton on its own absorbs, but if the proton is in the presence of an electron, the electron will shield the proton from the external magnetic field, resulting in a shift of the, of the signal for that proton towards more upfield frequencies or lower frequencies, lower chemical shifts. So the point is that hydrogens in an electron-rich environment are shielded. Here's an example. Um, methane. Here's in the NMR spectrum where the peak for methane would show up. Methyl chloride, you add an electronegative element that should pull electron density away from the carbon and therefore the hydrogens. Protons in this environment are more electron poor than in methane. They experience, because they are more electron poor, they are de-shielded. They are not as shielded from the external magnetic field. They experience a greater magnetic field and therefore absorb at a higher frequency or higher chemical shift. The concept of deshielding tracks pretty well with what you would expect based on simple electronegativity arguments. Uh, so being adjacent to a more electronegative atom would lead you to be being more deshielded or being closer to an electronegative atom should lead you to becoming more deshielded. As an example, chloroethane, the A protons are deshielded relative to the B protons. The signal for the HA protons is deshielded relative to HB. Why? Due to proximity to the electronegative chloro group. Let's look at a different example. 1 fluoro 2 bromo or 1 bromo 2 fluoro ethane because fluorine is more electronegative than bromine the HA protons should be deshielded relative to the HB protons again tracking mostly with what you expect for electronegativity and also proximity or closeness to electronegative groups. <clears throat> Finally, let's look at this molecule where I have HA, which is adjacent to two chloros, one, two bonds away from chloro. HA is one, two bonds away from these two chlorines, and one, two, three bonds away from one chlorine. HB is one, two bonds away from one chlorine, and one, two, three bonds away from two chlorines. 
HA is closer to more chlorines than is HB. Therefore, HA is again de-shielded relative to HB. Again, tracking mostly with you what you would expect based on proximity to electronegative atoms. All right, so uh, now we'll talk more broadly about different kinds of functional groups and the chemical shifts that they show up at in an NMR spectrum. Here is uh, sort of a schematic of that. This can also be shown to you in table format from zero chemical shift on the right to a chemical shift of around 12 on the left where chemical shifts in the right hand side are more shielded and chemical shifts on the left hand side protons that absorb at these chemical shifts are more de-shielded. <clears throat> So uh, alkyl protons, protons attached to carbons, where the carbons are not uh, attached to <coughs> any other electronegative atoms, <coughs> tend to absorb in the region of 0.5 to sort of 1.5 ppm. Being, if you replace one of these other alkyl substituents on the carbon with an electronegative heteroatom, such as a nitrogen, oxygen, or a halide, that will bump up the chemical shift of the proton on the carbon to the range of around um, two and a half to four and a half. So protons that are, if this is an alcohol or a nitrogen, oxygen, a nitrogen, or a halide, this is the alpha carbon, protons that are alpha to electronegative atoms tend to show up in the 3 to 4 region, ppm region of the NMR spectrum. <clears throat> in contrast, protons that are adjacent to pi bonds show up in the region 1.5 to 2.5 ppm. A lot of different pi bonds would give you an, uh, uh, signals in this region of the spectrum. The Z group could be a carbon, so this could be an alkene, in which case the, uh, for the alkene, we would call the proton adjacent to an alkene an allylic proton or an allyl proton. If, uh, so allylic protons show up in the 1.5 to 2.5 ppm region. If Z were oxygen, this would be a carbonyl compound and the proton would be alpha to a carbonyl. If you're alpha to a carbonyl, you also absorb in this region. Or if you're alpha to, if this were a nitrogen, the kind of functional group here would be called an imine. You will learn about imines in 352, uh, but being alpha to an imine is about the same in chemical shift as being alpha to a, a carbonyl, or being alpha or being at an allylic position. Also, in this potential region of the spectrum, you have uh, protons that are attached to the sp3, sorry, the sp hybridized carbon of a CH bond. <clears throat> or sorry, the sp hybridized carbon of an alkyne. Um, we'll say a little bit more as to why protons attached to sp hybridized carbons of alkynes show up in this region of the spectrum. We've already talked about protons that are uh, alpha to electronegative heteroatoms. Protons attached to the sp2 hybridized carbon of an alkene uh, at the so-called vinyl position or vinyl carbons I'm sorry, vinyl protons show up in the region of 4.5 to 6.5. And, and they're one of the few things that shows up in this region of the spectrum. So finding protons in this region of the spectrum can be an indicator for the presence of an alkene. Not shown in your table in your text, but important in a lot of research is the chemical shift for a proton that is actually on an amide nitrogen. These show up in the region of sort of 6 to 8 ppm, so it sort of spans these two adjacent areas of the spectrum.
You won't really encounter that in 351, though if you were to go on and do research in organic chemistry, that would become important. Um, protons that are attached to benzene rings or other examples of uh, aromatic rings. These are sp2 hybridized carbon-hydrogen bonds. There is a reason why they show up uh, deshielded relative to vinyl protons. Uh, sometimes we will call these protons that are attached to benzene rings or other aromatic rings aryl protons. And there's a reason why the aryl protons show up at higher chemical shift than the vinyl protons do. I'll say more about that in a little bit, but this region from 6.5 to 8 ppm generally contains only these uh, aryl protons, and so that can be quite diagnostic of a molecule that has a benzene, benzene or other aromatic ring. Then uh, in the higher end of the spectrum, from around 9 to 10 ppm, you can get a proton from an aldehyde. And then in the region from 10 to 12 ppm, you can get a carboxylic acid proton, a proton directly attached to uh, an oxygen. Noticeably absent uh, from this list are protons uh, attached to alcohol oxygens or amine nitrogens. The reason those are not on this list is because their chemical shifts are highly variable and context dependent. They vary because these functional groups are frequently involved in intermolecular hydrogen bonding, which can lead to uh, widely varying environments and therefore widely varying chemical shifts. Uh, here is a table that summarizes what we've discussed above. Um, one point that your text makes that I will echo here, though it's not particularly important, is that among sp3 hybridized carbon-hydrogen bonds, being on a primary carbon is more shielded than being on a secondary carbon, which is more shielded than being on a tertiary carbon. In other words, protons from tertiary carbons show up at higher chemical shifts than protons on primary carbons. This is a subtle effect, and it occurs because carbon is more electronegative, not much more, but slightly more electronegative than hydrogen, which means the more carbons I have as I go from primary to secondary to tertiary, uh, the more electron poor the proton gets and therefore the higher the chemical shift. Um, here are the protons that are alpha to carbonyls or alkenes. Uh, I said I would mention why an, uh, the sp hybridized carbon-hydrogen bond uh, gets a proton with a chemical shift in the range, range of two and a half. If you notice, being on an sp2 hybridized carbon gets you a chemical shift of four and a half to six and a half. And sp hybridized carbons are more electronegative than sp2 carbons. So you might expect an sp hybridized carbon hydrogen bond to have a higher chemical shift. Uh, but actually, you don't. And the reason for that is because the unique environment of the alkyne creates the possibility for a kind of circulating ring current induced magnetic field that shields the proton attached to the alkyne. So here is, and this you won't be able to really get from first principles. This is just a drawing of how you would, how from your text of what goes on. The alkene, the alkyne carbon-carbon bond is encased in a sheath of pi bonds, one uh, perpendicular to the plane of the page and then one in the plane of the page. In any case, um, that allows the electrons to circulate in such a way that generates the induced field lines shown. These field lines reinforce the external magnetic field out here, but oppose the external magnetic field here where the proton is. And so that proton is shielded, otherwise you'd expect it to be deshielded. Um, so that's why alkyne protons appear in a deshielded, or sorry, that is why alkyne protons appear 
in a relatively shielded portion of the spectrum, not necessarily where you would expect them. You don't need to understand how to generate these field lines. Um, this uh, drawing indicates sort of uh, a similar effect for the alkene where you have uh, uh, electrons above and below the plane of the sp2 hybridized trigonal planar carbons in the presence of an external magnetic field electron density circulates in a way that opposes the external magnetic field in the middle of the bond but reinforces the external magnetic field outside where the protons are so protons vinyl protons are deshielded uh, it turns out, though, that aryl protons are even more deshielded because the circular nature, the cyclic nature of the aromatic ring allows for electrons in the ring to circulate in a, in a larger circular pathway, generating a larger induced magnetic field. And again, that induced magnetic field opposes the external magnetic field in the middle of the ring but reinforces the external magnetic field outside the ring where the protons are. So protons in this uh, area that are aryl protons that are attached to a benzene ring are even more deshielded than vinyl protons are, and they absorb in the 6.5 to 8.5 ppm region. You won't have to be able to figure that out from first principles. You'll have access to a table that's very much like this that tells you the range of chemical shifts. Um, however, I warn you that attempts to not practice but just wing it and use the table and hope for the best are kind of like, uh, would kind of be like knowing how to read music but attempting to sight read something during a performance. It may not actually help you to know that the spaces on the treble clef stand for F, A, C, and E in that order if you're having to stop and figure that out while you're playing. Uh, you need enough experience so that this kind of thing comes naturally. Uh, we've already talked about aldehyde and carboxylic acid protons, and we've already talked about um, amine and alcohol protons. Sometimes the peaks for carboxylic acids, alcohol, and amine protons, sometimes those peaks are broad, and under certain situations, they sometimes are not, not even visible in the NMR spectrum. So you have to look for and interpret these peaks with care. All right, now let's talk about the intensity of NMR signals, by which we mean the integrated area of a peak. So in this spectrum, you can't see, but if you zoom in, this peak isn't just a straight line. It actually goes up to a point and then comes back down and you can measure the area under that peak. And one of the most interesting things about NMR is that the area under that peak is proportional to the number of protons represented by that particular NMR signal. So for methyl, tert, butyl, ether, you expect the peak for the methyl group to show up at higher chemical shift than the peak for the protons of the tert, butyl group because the protons of the methyl group are adjacent to an oxygen two bonds away from an oxygen whereas the protons of the tert butyl group are one to three bonds away from oxygen so you expect the methyl protons to be deshielded relative to the tert butyl protons uh, in addition because there are tw three times as many tert butyl protons as methyl protons you expect the peak for the tert butyl group to have three times the peak area of the peak from the methyl group. And that's exactly what we see if you integrate the area under the peak. This sort of curved line represents the computer's integration of that area. Uh, the ratio of peaks for this uh, methyl group versus the tert butyl group is one to three. Now notice that, that uh, that's a ratio and not intended to represent absolute number of protons because of course this peak for the methyl group represents three protons and the peak for the tert butyl group represents nine protons. The important thing is just the relative uh, peak area and the ratio of those peaks.
Uh, so if you were, for example, trying to predict peak areas for these three examples, uh, this example has two CH2 protons and three methyl protons. You would expect the peak area ratio to be 3 to 2 methyl to CH2 respectively. Now for the molecule just immediately to our right, we similarly expect to see two peaks in a 3 to 2 ratio, even though in this molecule there are actually six methyl protons and four for CH2 protons, and uh, same thing here for this molecule. So you have to be careful and make sure you're not attempting to interpret peak area as absolute numbers, but rather relative areas, relative ratios between peaks. All right, the third and perhaps most complicated and most informative piece of information that we get from NMR is the shape of the peak or what we call spin-spin splitting. So far I've been very careful to talk about NMR signals and not peaks because what you see in the spectrum of 1,1,2-tribromoethane uh, is that I have two NMR signals but each NMR signal is split into a cluster of peaks. The most deshielded proton should be the blue proton that is adjacent to two bromos, uh, and then the mo and then the more shielded of those protons should be these two red protons, which are adjacent to only one bromine. <clears throat> so you see a cluster of peaks for the CH blue proton and a cluster of peaks for the CH two red protons. And if we were to measure their relative peak areas, we would see that they're present in a 1 to 2 ratio. If you zoom in on the CH proton, you see that this single NMR signal is split into a cluster of peaks. There are three peaks, and they have uh, basically 1 to 2 to 1 ratio with respect to each other. That's called a triplet, and we'll talk about where that comes from but uh, it arises because this proton in blue is adjacent to other protons. <clears throat> the peak at lower chemical shift corresponding to the NMR signal for the two red protons, if we zoom in, is a two-peak pattern, which we call a doublet, and it's pre those two peaks are present in basically a one-to-one -one ratio. <clears throat> now, uh, as I said, this splitting is, uh, occurs when one NMR signal is split into multiple peaks. In our discussion, we're going to have to distinguish between an absorbing proton, which is the proton that gives rise to an NMR signal, and then the adjacent protons, which give rise to the splitting. So it's this blue proton that gives rise to this NMR signal but it's the red protons that cause the splitting present in that NMR signal. So when in analyzing this peak, the blue proton is the absorbing peak. The red protons are the adjacent protons. Similarly, were we to zoom in, if we were to zoom in on the uh, red peak for the red protons, the red protons would be the absorbing protons and the blue proton would be the adjacent one that causes the splitting into the doublet. <clears throat> So, uh, what adjacent protons cause splitting? These have to be protons that are adjacent to, usually either on the same carbon or on adjacent carbons, but they must not be identical to the absorbing protons. Notice that the peak that's, that represents this uh, CH2 group is split into a doublet. The two red protons do not split each other because they are equivalent, and this is generally observed equivalent protons do not split each other. So let's talk about the origin of the doublet. If you zoom in and look at this molecule, <clears throat> let's think about from the perspective of the red protons what environment they experience and how that environment is influenced by the blue protons. So um, in the presence of an external magnetic field, B0, there are two spin states that may be adopted by the adjacent proton, uh, blue proton. 
it may either be aligned with the external magnetic field or against the external mag magnetic field. And based on what we said in a previous lecture, the energy difference between those two spin states is small, such that you expect basically a 50-50 ratio of being aligned with versus against the external magnetic field for this adjacent proton. So from the perspective of the red protons, they experience two different environments. They experience environment one where they have the external magnetic field and the field of that adjacent uh, blue proton. We'll call that um, B plus the blue arrow and they experience another environment which is the external magnetic field minus the magnetic field caused by that adjacent proton. Remember protons uh, themselves have a magnetic moment so uh, the red protons may experience the external magnetic field plus the magnetic moment of the blue proton or the external magnetic field minus the magnetic field of the blue proton they can experience that at a 50-50 ratio. And so the pattern you observe there is called a doublet. Uh, so here is the peak for the red proton, and it's split into a one-to-one -one doublet. The one-to-one -one ratio is determined by the fact that uh, you have two different situations with equal probability. 50% of the time, the red protons are going to see that their adjacent proton is aligned with the magnetic field, and 50% of the time, they're going to see that the, their adjacent proton's magnetic moment is aligned against the external magnetic field. <clears throat> and so you see this splitting pattern called a doublet. It's a one-to-one -one doublet. That one-to-one -one ratio has to do with the probability issues we just talked about. And the spacing between those two peaks is called the coupling constant. And it's typically expressed in frequency units of hertz. You could express it in parts per million ppm, but if you did that, the number you got would be usually in the thousandths place in, or uh, in terms of decimals and um, would also be dependent upon the instrument that you did the experiment in. Whereas if you express it in frequency units, it's actually totally independent of the, of the instrument that you're doing the experiment in. So the spacing between the two peaks of the doublet is called the coupling constant. And it varies from, uh, from almost nothing to uh, 18 hertz, though a standard sort of average coupling constant is around 7 hertz. Now let's talk, talk briefly about uh, the origin of the triplet. <clears throat> this one's just a little bit trickier. So from our perspective now, we are the red pro or, or we are, uh, yeah, from the perspective of, we're now thinking about the, the origin of the triplet. Now our perspective is going to be the blue proton. Uh, that will be the absorbing proton. The blue proton is adjacent to HA and HB. These are two identical in, in antiotopic protons. Um, let's talk about, and, and a, both HA and HB may have two different possibilities for their magnetic moments. For HA, it can be either with or against the external magnetic field, again in a 50 to 50 ratio. Whereas H, uh, I guess what I did there was for HB, whereas for HA, it may either be aligned with or against the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, again in a 50-50 ratio. So there are um, two, there are three possibilities for what the blue proton can experience. It can experience the external magnetic field with both A and B being aligned with that magnetic field. It can experience the external magnetic field where A is aligned with 
and B is aligned against. And it can experience the more or less equivalent situation in which A would be aligned against and B would be aligned with the external magnetic field. And then it can, of course, experience the situation where both protons A and B are aligned against the external magnetic field. Of course, if you, uh, the probability of any one of these A or B being with versus against the magnetic field is 50%. So the probability of possibility one is 25%. The probability of possibility 2 is 25% plus 25% or 50% overall. And then the possibility of having both magnetic fields aligned, uh, both magnetic moments for A and B aligned against the external magnetic field is also 25%. So you expect to see three different chemical shifts for proton absorbing proton H based on these three possibilities, and they ought to be present in a 25 to 50 to 25 or a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, <clears throat> which is what we observe, and that's summarized here. Um, the peak for the blue proton is split into a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Uh, the peak here comes from the 25% of cases where both magnetic moments for A and B are aligned with the external magnetic field. So the blue proton experiences a larger magnetic field in 25% of cases. And so we show up at this slightly higher chemical shift. Then in 50% of cases, the blue proton experience just the external magnetic field itself because the impact of the magnetic moments for A and B cancel each other out. That's 50% of cases, so that's this peak here. And then the third peak is where both magnetic moments for neighboring protons A and B are aligned against the magnetic field, and that gives you the 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of peaks. That is a 1 to 2 to 1 triplet. Two sets of protons that split each other's NMR signals are said to be coupled. So HA and B are coupled to blue proton, which I guess we can call blue proton C. Uh, moreover, the spacing between peaks for coupled protons has to be identical. So the distance in, in, in hertz between these two doublet peaks has to be identical to the, to the, to the difference in hertz between the peaks of the triplet, between neighboring peaks of the triplet. All right, and I believe that's about as far as we got on Friday. Uh, so with, uh, I will just point out that the two line pattern here for the red protons tells me that I have one adjacent proton. The three line one to two to one triplet here for the blue absorbing proton C tells me I have two adjacent protons. And with that, we'll stop uh, because I believe that's where we stopped on Friday.